That was awesome. It was so much fun. I have to tell you just a little bit about Run for the Light. If you don't know what Run for the Light is, um, it's really less about running and more about making a difference in the world through our missions giving. It's just a mechanism uh, to raise money for missions. And uh, I'm just so proud of you. We had 59 uh, runners. We had probably 25 or so volunteers. It was just a fantastic day. Uh, all of the runners uh, asked people to sponsor them. And as of this morning, uh, we've raised $30,000 for missions. How cool is that? <clears throat> and you might know this, but we have a matching donor that's going to match every dollar up to $75,000. So that actually means we've raised $60,000. And this goes to a ministry called Feed One that I'm going to tell you a little bit about in just a second. Um, feed One, you can feed a child for $10 a month. And so if you just do the really simple math, what that $60,000 means is that 500 kids who would not have had uh, a good food to eat on a regular basis will be fed for the next year because you decided you could go and you could walk or run or whatever your version of that was. You asked people to donate. Uh, you, you jumped in and you are making a difference as well. This is pretty exciting. There's a dozen churches across the state of New Mexico today that are participating in what we're calling New Mexico Feed One Day. And so all of those churches are taking up offerings today, and they'll be sending those in this week. And that's hopefully what's going to get us to that full $75,000 is all of us working together. So I will be sure to keep you updated uh, on that in the coming weeks as all of that comes in. Before we talk more about Feed One, I have some awards that I want to give away from yesterday's uh, Run for the Life. If you know us at Harvest, we don't take ourselves too seriously, which means we just like to have a whole lot of fun. And so after the run, uh, a, bi a big group of us in our, our, our clothes, we were covered in paint, and we all went to Chick-fil-A, and we ate. And before we left, we said, hey, we should do some awards tomorrow. And so we just quickly kind of brainstormed a few awards. And so here's, here's the awards uh, that were given away today. The first one, and we have some pictures because you need to see a few of these. This is for the best shoes award, okay? So if you know, if you're a runner, uh, shoes are a big deal. And uh, there was one person that showed up with what we considered the very best shoes, and her name is Claire Gibbons. And I want to show you a picture. Look at those, look at those cute little shoes. All right, uh, Richard, come, come, would you come accept this award on behalf of your daughter? Um, and it does come with a Chick-fil-A gift card, because that's where I was yesterday when we dreamed this up, all right? Way to go. Way to go to Claire. Um, and then uh, this one is, uh, this is for our fastest runner uh, of the day. And so we call this the Gazelle Award. This person channeled his inner gazelle and just ran the course. Just, I mean, it, he just made it look really, really easy. I teased him this morning. I said, man, if, if a lion was chasing you, I still think they would have caught you. He said, no way. He would have eaten all of you first, okay? And so... <laughs> So the Gazelle Award goes to Creed Owen, and uh, come on, Creed. You also get a Chick-fil-A gift card. <clears throat> We couldn't have done this run without our amazing volunteers, and so we created an award for the most helpful water boy, okay? And so we had a, a, a water station, and we had volunteers out there filling up the, the water cups and handing them out and, and helping all of us that were running to, to stay out there. And so the most helpful water boy uh, award goes to Martin Wilson. Martin, come on up here, man. <laughs> yeah, well, you should have ran. There you go, buddy. Thank you for your help yesterday. <laughs> All right. And then one last one. Uh, this is for the person who showed up in the best running attire, okay? Best running attire. And it might not be exactly what you're thinking uh, because this person decided to run in full firefighter gear. All right. And so we have a picture right there. Richard, come on, Richard. Richard did the entire 5K in full firefighter gear, and uh, I, I just, I, I don't know how he did it, all right? I don't know. Way to go, Richard. He also is our number one fundraiser. Um, way to go, buddy. Way to go. Hey, that's your, that's your gift card. All right, all right. There we go. All right, can I tell you about Feed One for just a minute? 
Uh, I love Feed One. I was invited to go, uh, I think, six or seven years ago on a Feed One trip uh, to Haiti. I got to see firsthand this incredible ministry. And as soon as I saw it, I said, this is something I want to be a part of. We came home. We talked to you about it. Many of you ha have already been sponsoring kids uh, at $10 a month for many, 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 many years now. Uh, and, and so we just continue to do this year over year over year over year. And this year, as we were planning our run for the light. We felt like this would be a, a fantastic opportunity to just really give Feed One a big shot in the arm. They're currently feeding over half a million kids in 26 different countries. What I love about what they do is all of their feeding centers are at locations where the gospel is also being presented. So they're, they're being done at schools and daycares and churches and, and all these places where they're hearing about the gospel. And I'll just tell you, I've been to Haiti. I've been to Nicaragua. I've been to El Salvador. I've seen their, their ministry at work. It's absolutely phenomenal. It's one of my favorite ministries to support. And so today, as you came in, uh, on many of your chairs, there's a little packet that looks like this. And uh, there's also this QR code behind me. You can just scan with your phone. That'll do everything this packet does uh, digitally. And what I'd love to ask you to consider, uh, I will never twist your arm into uh, giving, into being generous, but I will push you, okay? I won't twist your arm, but I will push you. I think it's one of my jobs as your pastor is to encourage you in what I believe is the best way to live, which is with open hands. And so we're doing two things uh, this weekend. Uh, we've been raising money uh, through the run, and I just reported to you the 30000 but today I also want to give you an opportunity for your family to sponsor one or more children at just $10 a month. Years ago when we did it, Lisa and I talked, we said, you know, we have three girls, so let's sponsor three children. And so we sponsored those three. We've never stopped. It's been incredible. Um, our kids uh, uh, that we originally sponsored are actually at an orphanage in Haiti. And uh, I was able to go to that orphanage. Uh, some of you, Martha was there with me, and Guy was there with me, and several of our church, we got to go. We did a dental clinic there for those kids. I'm just telling you, like, I, it is absolutely incredible. And so today, across the New Mexico, in these 12 churches, uh, all of them are doing this. We're sponsoring kids. I can't wait to see how many kids we sponsor. We're trying to really make a difference. So if you want to do that, you can fill out the card uh, that's in that packet, and you can drop that off at one of our, our giving boxes on your way out, or you can scan it. You can do it all digitally, and uh, let's just, let's keep taking care of kids. Let's feed kids. Let's, let's really make a difference. Are you in with me? All right, there we go. That's all. It, oh, by the way, I brought this so I wouldn't forget. Um, I have some Feed One shirts. Okay, they look like this. Pastor Jace was modeling one uh, earlier. And uh, if you would like one, as long as they last, they're free. I've got some at the hospitality desk back there. On your way out, just stop by. by. Whether you sponsor a kid or you don't, just say, I want a Feed One shirt. They will give one to you. This one is a large. Does anyone want a large Feed One shirt? There we go. You're, you're closer. I'm sorry. I couldn't. I, my arm's not that good. Just stop by there. They're free, okay? All right. Uh, also, and then I promise we're going to get to the message. There's a lot going on. Uh, you might have noticed our Trail Life guys out in the lobby on their way in. Um, in fact, can I get all our Trail Life guys that are in the room? Can, would you stand up real quick? All our Trail Life leaders, our trail men. There's some up there, some right there. Um, so let me tell you, thank you all, you, you don't have to stay standing, but we wanted to honor them today. Today is Trail Life Sunday uh, across the nation, and I love this ministry. It's a ministry that's geared towards boys and discipling boys, and they use uh, things like camping uh, to be able to teach them uh, uh, these things. And so I just love this troop, and today across the nation, we're celebrating Trail Life. There's currently 50,000 trail men in 1,100 troops, and we happen to have one of those troops, and tomorrow is our troop's fourth birthday, all right, as a troop, and so all of that was coinciding, and I told Mike Pittman, Mike leads it, I was like, man, we need to celebrate that, and so if you uh, have a, a young man in your home that you think might uh, benefit from this, stop by the booth on your way out, talk to any of our leaders, find out uh, what's going on, and by the way, their next troop event is a family camp out uh, coming up in October, and so I just, I, I love what these guys are doing. It's a ton of fun, and I just wanted to give them a shout out. All right, are you ready for the message today? That was a lot, right? Everyone take a deep breath. <sighs> okay, there we go. There we go. 
We kicked off a series last week by the title, Out of the Cave, Now What? It's a series all about mental health. We heard a stat last week that one in five adults and one in six adolescents are currently facing mental health issues. According to the CDC, a third of Americans report suffering with severe anxiety and or depression. There's a recent Gallup poll that says 60% of Americans say that they are, uh, are dealing daily with high levels of stress. All of this is just to say that this is a topic that I believe is very, very important, one that I don't think that we as a church can turn a blind I too. And sadly, this has really been the norm that for too long the church has avoided this topic. And when we have talked about it, we really haven't done a good job of talking about it. And in fact, one of my goals for this series is to hopefully change the stigma around this topic. I'll, I'll just give you uh, an example. Um, when someone shares with you that they're having a physical health problem, we usually don't shame them, right? If someone says, hey, I've been diagnosed with, let, let's just say, diabetes, we don't say to them, well, you should just pray more, right? Like, that wouldn't have happened if you were just praying more. And, and so when, when someone has a physical health problem, we, we do a number of things to support them. We pray for them. We take them meals. We encourage them to go to a doctor. We, we encourage them to take the medication that's been prescribed to them. We tell them they should rest. We tell them to drink plenty of fluids. Like These are all the things that we do when someone has a physical illness. And I've, I've often wondered why we don't approach mental health in a very similar fashion. Uh, my friend Peter Pignon kicked off our series last week. He's a professional counselor. Uh, did you enjoy uh, Peter being here, by the way? Um, I thought he just did a fantastic job. And one of the things that Peter offered us, and I just I wanted to make sure you knew about it, is he offered us a free resource. Um, that it, it's online. You can scan this QR code. We have lots of QR codes today. You can scan this QR code, and, and it'll take you to a, a page that has two free courses, Mental Health 101 and Mental Health 102. And I want to make sure you know that there's a mental re health resource library that covers 20 different topics from stress to suicide prevention, trauma, parenting, marriage, depression, bipolar, anger, ADHD, I don't know anyone that needs that, addiction, and a whole lot more, okay? And this is all free. Peter, when I reached out months ago, said, hey, would you come to Harvest? He started putting this together. He made it available absolutely free, and I just want you to know about it as we're moving through this series. Let me tell you where this series really began. Two years ago, uh, a pastor by the name of Chris Hodges wrote a book titled Out of the Cave. Uh, I read this book uh, 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 cover to cover. I mean, I just devoured it. I was in a season where it just, I needed this. I, I read it and I immediately knew that it was a topic that we needed to talk about in the church. So shortly after, I preached a series by the same title. In this series, in this book, Pastor Hodges uses the analogy of a cave to describe what it often feels like when you're battling mental illness and specifically depression. If you've ever been depressed, you probably get this. When you're in depression, it feels like you're in a deep, dark, cold, disorienting, lonely place. And the scary part is you don't know how to get out of it. It's this fantastic analogy that then we take to Scripture. In 2 Kings, there's a, a man by the name of Elijah, and in this account, he, Elijah literally goes into a cave, but he also, as you read this story, he also goes into the cave of depression. And so we use this account to frame the, the first series out of the cave, and, and, and that's what we talked about, was how, how do we overcome the mental health problems that we are facing? But I got to thinking about what happens when a person begins the journey of coming out of the cave. Because if you've been in the cave for a long time, the cave strangely begins to feel safe 
and somewhat comforting. And now as you step out of the cave, and I don't know if you've ever done this, uh, I've been in some caves like literally in my life, and, and your eyes start to adjust to the dark, and as you come out, the light can be blinding. And now that you stepped out into the, into the light, it, it's supposed to be amazing. But in that moment, I'm just telling you, it's about as lonely as it was in the cave. Because now you're blinded, you're disoriented, you don't know who to talk to, you don't know what to do. And so my hope for you is to help you with what do we do as we come out of the cave? Because here's what I know is that God has a big dream for your life. And in case you're wondering what that dream is, I'll just point you to my favorite scripture, John chapter 10, verse 10. Jesus tells us first about the enemy's plan for our lives, and then he tells us about his plan for our life. And he says this about the enemy. He says, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That is the plan of Satan for you, for your health, for your mental health, for your physical health, for your family, for your finances, for every part of your life, is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I'm so thankful the verse doesn't end there, because Jesus says, but I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. And that's my dream, is that you would discover the full life that Jesus has for you. So before we dig in, I want us to do what we do every week. We're going to pause. We're going to pray. This is an important moment because God has a word for every single person in this room. But here's my dream is that while he talks to all of us, I want him to talk to you individually. And so we pause and we just pray. We position our hearts to hear from him today. And I believe he's going to talk to us. Do you believe God's going to talk to us today? Do you believe that? All right, six of you do. You're going to hear from him. All right. All right, let's pray. Ready? Let's pray. Jesus, I'm so thankful for your word. It's living, it's active, it's powerful. Lord, today you have a word for, for harvest, but while you have a word for us collectively, you have some very individual words for people that are sitting in this room right now, people who are watching online right now. And so we just pause to take note of the importance of this moment. And as we open your word, we also open our hearts and we just say, Lord, we're listening. Will you talk to us today? In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said... Amen. Uh, my wife and I have uh, three girls and one dog. Uh, the dog is a boy. We tried to um, kind of average things out slightly. It has not worked, just so you know. Uh, I'm still very um, over num- uh, outnumbered in my house. But we all love our dog. He's very spoiled. His name is Cooper. Uh, Cooper loves to go out of our house, through his dog door, around the corner, and to our gate that faces the driveway to bark at the UPS drivers and the FedEx drivers, who he believes are a Attacking our castle, all right? He loves to do this. And so in doing this over and over and over, he has worn a path around from our patio, around the corner, and to our gate. I took a picture yesterday. You kind of see there. Um, all of that ground used to be flat, uh, but his running back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, he's created, uh, I'll call it a rut, in our backyard from our patio to the gate. And why am I telling you about the path that our dog has created in our backyard? Because I believe that it's one of the secrets to learning what to do as you step out of the cave. In the same way that you could go to my backyard today and you could see the well-worn path of Cooper, I believe that if we could look into your brain, there are some well-worn paths in your brain that scientists would call neural pathways. Now, today, I just have to warn you, especially right here at this point in the message, it's going to be a little bit science and a little bit Bible, but it's all God because God created all of it. And I just... I want you to know just a little bit about how your brain works because it'll help you, I promise, as you begin to venture out of the cave, okay? So we're going we're gonna to nerd out for just a minute. Do you have any nerds in the room? Come on, fellow nerds, nerds unite, okay? I was a, I was a nerd in high school proudly. I'm, I'm wearing the nerd shirt today. I'm proud, all right? And so, so nerds, we're, you're going to really love this. Everyone else, just put up with us for just a minute. I want you to know how God created your brain. Now, there's a saying, maybe you've heard it. Uh, have you ever heard someone say, it's as easy as riding a bike? Have you ever heard anyone say that? Um, I've often wondered who 
created that saying and if they remember what it was like to learn how to ride a bike. Do you remember learning how to ride a bike? It's actually not that easy learning how to ride a bike. Now, confession time for just a minute. Lisa actually taught all of our girls how to ride a bike, okay? It was not me. It was for sure Lisa, all right? She taught them how to ride a bike. She had the patience for it. I did not, okay? When you're learning how to ride a bike, initially it's awkward, you fall a lot, am I right? You fall a lot, you're, you're kind of wobbly. Overall, if someone were watching, they, they probably would be laughing at you because it's kind of funny watching someone you know, figure out how to put all the pieces uh, of this process together. But as you continue over time, uh, you put your mind to it, something happens, and your body begins to coordinate all of these sensory inputs, and you begin using complex major motor skills and then you repeat these steps over and over and over and eventually you get it and I, and I remember with each of the girls that moment when they get it and Lisa would be behind them she's holding onto the seat and then she lets go of the seat and they keep on going and this time they don't fall and we all cheer and it's like you finally got it right you finally got it. you put all of the pieces together so here's where the science gets kind of fascinating to me, is that this repetition of these actions that you do and these thoughts that you have over and over, they actually produce a neurochemical change in your mind. Your brain, as this is happening, is actually redesigning itself around these new thoughts and these new actions that you are learning. It's, your brain is this complex command center, and your brain begins to activate your brain body through something called neurons, and these neurons begin to link together to create messages, and over time what they do is they create what scientists call neural pathways. Are you still with me? Tell me you're still with me. All right, I, I knew the nerds would be with me. And, all right, sorry. And, and here's what happens is the presence of these neural pathways now make it easier for you to think those thoughts and for your body to perform those actions, and every time you do it, the pathway gets stronger, and the action gets a little bit easier. So, so simply put, I'll just call them, and kind of unscientifically, you're creating what I'll call brain ruts, okay? Brain ruts, and, and it gets easier and easier and easier. The more you do something, the more often you think the thought, uh, the easier it is. Uh, it goes from awkward and difficult to now it's so simple and easy. In fact, uh, you've discovered that with enough repetition, uh, it becomes almost automatic, and now you fall into this, this not just a neurological pathway, but it's, it becomes a rut. You just kind of get into that rut, and now you don't even have to think anymore, uh, at least like, like, like not, not, you know, you're not having to really think consciously about these decisions, but now everything just begins to click. I don't know if this has happened to you. Have you ever driven home from work and you get into your driveway and as you put your car into park, you think, I don't even know how I got here. Has that ever happened? Come on. And this is because of neural pathways. And it's actually, it's kind of scary to think about because from your work to your driveway, think about all of the steps, the twists, the turns, the brake, the gas, the turn signal, the radio, all the things that have to happen. And you get there and you think, I'm not even sure how this happened. That is a result of a neural pathway. Now, I, I hope I'm not boring you. Can I, can I nerd out one, just like one little bit more? Would that be okay? All right, I'm going to do it anyway. So, the, so here we go. In addition to these neural pathways, there's also a little bundle of nerves at the base of your brain, and it's called the reticular activating system, okay? We're going to call it the RAS for short, okay, because that's easier to say. And our neural pathways are carved out even deeper by the RAS through millions of pieces of sensory data that's being sent to our brain. And what the RAS system begins to do, it's fascinating, is it begins to categorize those thoughts, and it begins to group them 
together in relevancy and similarity. And what happens is this happens so your brain doesn't uh, short circuit, right? So it doesn't get overloaded. And so the RAS begins to filter out the unnecessary information, right? All those Facebook posts that you're scrolling through, it just pushes them aside, right? And it just scrolls through them. And, and it allows, the RAS allows the important information to get through. And, it, and this amazes me, but in my research, I found out that it only keeps about 121 pieces of data at any one time, okay? Now, where the rest goes, I have no idea, okay? One of you can come tell me about it later. This is how God created your brain and my brain to be able to filter out the data in your life so that you can focus on what's the most important and you can eliminate the rest. So what it does is if the information that the RAS system is, is filtering, if it keeps you alive, if it prevents problems, if it averts danger, or if it brings you pleasure, the RAS system is activated. And now there's this multitasking, filtering, deleting system that's actually hardwired into your brain. It hears what's the most important, and it connects the subconscious to our conscious. And, and here's what, what I love. This is important for you and I as followers of Christ is the RAS actually utilizes our beliefs. The things that you believe are now added to the data that your brain is collecting and now it helps you make decisions. Is God amazing or what? That's how God designed your brain. And this is what I call very unscientifically a brain rut. Okay, a rut. Uh, ruts are dangerous. Webster defines a rut as a track worn by a wheel or by a habitual passage, okay? A rut is what Cooper did in my backyard, all right? Now, maybe you've been somewhere and you've seen a rut, okay? Ruts can be dangerous because you get in them, you fall into them, and now it's difficult to get out. There's actually a road in Alaska um, that, that they put a sign up because it's so filled with ruts, and it's muddy, and, and so they put a sign up that says, choose your rut carefully because you're going to be in it for the next 60 miles. <laughs> All right, it's a good warning. Pick your rut <laughs> carefully. And this is the problem with ruts, is you get into them, and it's hard to get out. I actually have been in a few ruts in my life. I'll tell you about one of them. Years ago, Lisa and I were in college. We were asked to lead a missions trip to Africa. We were in Kenya, and while we were there, we got to go out into an area called the Maasai Mara, and it was just amazing. We were able to take a, a, a Jesus film that had been recently translated into their language and uh, show it to them and, and, and preach the gospel. It was fantastic. And while they were there, the missionary said, hey, would you guys like to do a photo safari? Uh, and, and we said yes. And so they loaded us into vans. They had these little uh, rooftop things that would lift up. We could stand up and look out through the, through the top of the car. We saw all, I mean, giraffes and zebras and elephants and hyenas and all the animals. And at the very end of the day, it was, the sun was beginning to set. And uh, we entered a part of the road where there had been a lot of moisture, a lot of rain. And I noticed that there were some ruts. And, and our van driver, uh, uh, his name, I don't actually know his name, but he went by Banana, okay? I don't know why, um, but he, he went by Banana. And they had radios, and they'd radio back and forth. And, and we'd hear on the radio, Banana, Banana, come in, radio, Banana, Banana. And we just loved it. And so he falls into a rut, and we're driving, and all of a sudden, that rut led us through a big puddle in the middle of the road. And Banana thought he could get through it, but Banana did not get through it. We got stuck, and it's starting to get dark. And we started hearing a lion, and the girls started screaming. And so we got out of the car, we rolled up our pants, we got out in the mud, and we helped Banana push the van through the puddle and out. We loaded everyone back in, and we made it home safely because we're here today. You, so you, know, you knew the end of that story, okay? Ruts are dangerous. I don't want you, okay, to fall into the wrong mind rut. 
So if all of this is true, how God designed our brains and how neural pathways are formed and how, how the RAS system digs those deeper, if all of this is true, then, then you come out of the cave and you're looking around and you're saying, all right, I'm, I'm starting to come out. Now what do I do? Well, one of the answers is simply this, is that you're going to need to create some new pathways. And all of that begins right here. I have three things to talk to you about today. The first one is this, is recognize your rut. Recognize your rut. The question is this, what are the well-worn paths in your life? I'll give you some examples, okay? I'm not judging. I'm just giving you examples, okay? I will start really, really innocent, okay? You come home, and you're sad, and so this might be your neural pathway. You reach for the chocolate. Come on. Anybody? Anybody? Where are my chocolate people at? All right. You get home. You're sad. You go to the freezer to find a gallon of ice cream. Come on, somebody, right? Isn't it amazing how much better you feel with a gallon of ice cream in your lap? Isn't it? It's even better when it goes into your belly, but, but it starts right. You just, I mean, just eat. I'm talking about eating out of a carton, right? I mean, it's just like, I'll decide when enough is enough, right? <laughs> and you just, okay, this is a neural pathway, okay? Uh, I am pro ice cream, but this could be a neural pathway. Maybe here's another one. Maybe you come home and you've had a hard day, and so you, you pour yourself a glass of wine. Here, here's another more, uh, neural pathway. You wake up. What's the very first thing you reach for? Maybe the first thing you reach for is your phone. That's a neural pathway. Um, you're stuck in traffic. You're, you're, you're stuck, and so you're mumbling under your breath, right? That is a neural pathway. Your kids start fighting. You raise your voice. These are, these are neural pathways, and I'm just asking, what are the well-worn tracks in your life? The problem is that when we do these things, when you reach for the ice cream, when you reach for the glass of wine, when you reach for the phone, that's just helping you to see that this is my go-to. And when you do that, you're creating a neural pathway, or I'll, I'll call it a rut. And in most of these cases, it's actually working against you. Maybe you can relate to the Apostle Paul who said these words in Romans chapter 7. He said this. Tell, tell me if you've ever felt this way. Paul said, I do not understand what I do. Let's just stop there. Anyone ever felt that way? Okay. Anyone ever felt that way about your kids? Come on. How about your spouse? It's okay. You can admit. I do not understand what I do for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do, okay? Did you, he, sometimes I'm like Paul, he's like a Riddler, right? Him and Dr. Seuss, they wrote Romans 7 together. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it's no longer myself who, uh, I myself who do it, but it is a sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I can't cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Are you following? Okay. And then, yeah, it's hard. And then he says this in verse 23, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind. What Paul is saying here is he's identifying some brain ruts. <laughs> he's identifying some neural pathways. He says, there's a war raging in my mind. And he goes on, he says, it makes me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. And then he comes to this conclusion, what a wretched man I am. Let me just tell you, this is a man who gets it. These verses are a soul cry of frustration, of exasperation. In fact, I don't know if you noticed, he repeats himself, himself a ridiculous amount of times, right? And it's this, it's this rant from the depths of his soul. His mind cycle is maddening. And can't we relate to the wrestling in Paul's mind that he's going through? I do what I don't want to do, and I don't do what I do want to do. But he finishes with this, verse 25. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Isn't that good news? 
After all that wrestling, after seeing, you know, the, the neural pathways in his, brain, in his brain, he says, but thanks be to God who can rescue me. Paul's making an important declaration here. And let me just say this in case maybe you don't know who Paul is. Paul is a giant in our faith. I mean, Paul, he, he, many will call him the apostle Paul. He's a founding figure in, in, in what we read about in the Bible. And, and I love that Paul is letting us in to this painful tension that he's living in, that, that Paul is actually grieving over. He, he's lamenting over this. And again, I'll just remind you, Paul's a hardcore Jesus follower. He's one of the best, but he's struggling with a battle in his mind. The Apostle Paul, in this passage, I believe, is pleading with you and I to recognize the ruts that develop in our brain, and he's doing so by revealing his own. He's not just pointing out, you know, all the things that you do. He's saying, look, I have these brain ruts as well. You should check out your own. That's what he's really saying. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying. He's, he's saying, look, I'll reveal mine so that you might be inspired to look at yours. If I go back to the Alaska rut analogy, Paul is stopping the car on the Alaskan highway and he's getting out of the car and he's trudging through the mud and the mess of his life and he's putting a new sign in the ground. He's putting a road sign of truth on God's word. He's staking his hope in Jesus who's a living hope and he's making a declaration that I don't have to stay in this rut. And some of us today need to get out of the proverbial car that we've been in a rut in. We need to do the same thing. We need to stake a new sign. Paul recognized his rut, but he didn't say stuck. Instead, he identified the ruts. And then he declared with immense gratitude, thanks be to God who delivers me through Christ our Lord. So I'm encouraging you today, come out of the cave. Now what? First of all, recognize your ruts. Once you do that, here's number two, renew your mind. Renew your mind. Let me tell you what a lot of people try to do instead is they try to modify the negative behavior. Most of us, if, if we had to make a list of things that we wanted to change we would, in our own lives, we would identify behaviors that we're not proud of. And what most people try to do is they try to modify the behavior. So they say, I'm just going to stop uh, yelling so much, or I'm going to drink less, or I'm not going to work as much. And they try to, to, to focus on the behavior. But I just need to warn you that behavior modification doesn't work because because it only attacks the behavior and not the root. It'll sound kind of silly to you, but if you looked out your window at your house and you saw a tree that was in your yard and you thought, boy, that's an ugly tree. I don't want that tree in my yard anymore. And you walked to your garage and you got yourself a saw and you walked out to that tree and you cut a limb off of that tree and you went back in your house and you felt very satisfied that you had dealt with this tree in your yard and you went to bed that night and the next morning you get up, you've poured your cup of coffee and you walk to your window and you look out and you thought, what in the world? Why is that tree still there? I thought I dealt with that tree. None of us would do that. Because you know that if you want the tree out of your yard, you have to deal with the root and not the limbs. And this is the same way when it comes to our ruts in our lives. I'm not actually asking you to deal with the behaviors, because if you deal with the root, the behaviors will change. The behaviors will absolutely change if you deal with the root. So what I'm telling you today is that your neural pathways don't just need to be shifted, they need to be renewed. <laughs> they need to be rewired. <laughs> you and I have developed neural pathways to cope with the reasons we're back in these deep, dark caves. And, and, and I just want to, I'll leave you with, Peter left us uh, last week with this phrase. I loved it. He left us with this. He said, transformation is possible. Does anyone believe that? 
Transformation is possible. And I just want to pick up there where Peter left off. And I want to tell you, I believe that. That I believe that no matter how deep the ruts are, no matter how long they've been there, no matter how many generations back they go, that transformation is possible. But it's going to require you to have your mind renewed. Those ruts are powerful. They're deep. They're strong. But they are not as powerful as God working in you. So how do we renew our mind? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22 says this, Throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, watch this, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on the new nature. It's a new. It's not, it's not just changing the old. It's a new nature created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. So I, just, I don't want you to think that I'm being a, a motivational speaker today and telling you just think positive thoughts. I want you to be positive, but positive thoughts alone are not going to change the brain rut that you've developed over all of these years. Positive thoughts are not going to renew your mind. This is not about put a smile on your face and just fake your way through a season of anxiety or depression. I'm talking about allowing the Spirit of God to breathe life into you and to completely renew your mind. I love this about the gospel. The gospel is the power for us to change. You don't have to stay stuck. Transformation is possible with Jesus. Old becomes new. Dead comes to life. Broken is restored. Sick is healed. And this is such good news because the renewal of our mind actually starts Not with you being positive or trying to just change your thinking. It literally begins with what God does inside of you. I'm just telling you, he can renew your mind. He can renew your mind. And please know this, you're not subject to the thought patterns that you currently have, okay? I know they're strong and they're powerful, but you are not subject to to them. At the end of the day, you and I have spiritual authority over what happens in our minds. Did you know this? Some of us think that our minds get to control what we do, right? It's like I'm just powerless, right? I was driving by Chick-fil-A and I just I just had to turn in. I mean, I, I thought about those those nugs and I just had to I just had to I couldn't help myself, right? Let me just tell you You have authority over your mind. You get, let me show it to you. You don't believe me, so let me show it to you. Watch this. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 10, verse 5. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And watch this. And we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Listen, you have the authority. When a thought comes into your mind, to take that thought captive, and I love this language, and make that thought bow in obedience to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You do not have to give in to depressive thoughts. Oh, well, here it comes again. I'm just going to go back into my little cave again. You literally have the ability in your spirit person, okay? Again, I'm talking spiritually to take that thought and hold it up against the word of God and the promises of God and the power of God and the authority of God and say, you know what? You have to bow to my God, not the other way around. We can take thoughts captive. We make them obey to Jesus Christ. Now, I do want to give you something practical as well. Here's a practical way to take what we know about biology and how God created our brains and rewiring the pathways so as your mind is being renewed, these ruts are being filled in, right? They're, 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 being, they're being taken care of, all right? Then, then you go to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8, because as these thoughts are, are, you're taking old thoughts out and you need new thoughts. So what do I think about? Ephesians 4 says this, whatever is true, 
Whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if it is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So these destructive thoughts, we make them obey, we make them captive to Christ, and we replace them with thoughts that are true and pure and right and lovely and admirable and excellent and praiseworthy. So we recognize our ruts, we renew our mind, and here's the last one, you reinforce your footing. You reinforce your footing. Now here's the deal. A footing looks a lot like a rut, okay? At first glance, if you, if you drove by a, a job site today and they had dug footings for their house or their building or their, their wall, you might see that and you might think that it's a rut because it looks very similar at first glance. But I want to tell you that a footing is very different than a rut, okay? A footing is intentional. A footing is built to, is designed to build something worthwhile on top of. There's a design to it. When I was a teenager, my my family, we, we moved into a new house and not far from here, and uh, we had a pretty good front yard. And when I saw that front yard, I said to my dad, I said, Dad, there's enough room up here that we could probably have like a half-court basketball court. We could put a basketball goal over here, pour a little extra concrete that connects to our current driveway. And, Dad, I mean, we could have like a basketball court out here. And so my dad came up with an idea. My dad said, Jason, here's what we're going to do. If you and your brother We'll dig a footing for the block wall that needs to go around the perimeter of our property. Then when we finish the wall, I'll build you a basketball court. And I thought this sounded like an awesome idea. I still don't know how I did it because my brother hates basketball. But somehow I convinced my brother to help me. We got out there with shovels and picks and we were digging bars. And I quickly learned that this New Mexico sand is not nearly as easy to dig as I thought it was. So we started digging, or we, we marked the perimeter, we started digging, and we hit hard ground. And so every day before we'd go to school, we would turn the water hose on, and we'd fill that, that, that footing that we had dug with water so it would soften up the ground. And then that day when we got home from school, we'd dig a little bit more out. We'd make you know, a little bit of progress, and then we'd water it again, and we'd dig a little more, and we'd water it. It was awful, y'all. It was terrible. I absolutely hated it, okay? But at the end, but I wanted a basketball court. We got this footing dug, and I don't know if you've ever done any footings, but we, we got it the right depth, and we got it the right width. We put some rebar in there to reinforce it. One day, a concrete truck showed up, and we filled that footing with concrete. And the next thing you know, Dad was starting to lay the blocks, and that wall got higher and higher and higher, and eventually, he built a, a block wall around our entire property, and as soon as he finished, I said, Dad, I want my basketball court. I'm holding you to it. And he did. He built me a basketball court. You'd think I would be a professional basketball player now, but no, I'm a pastor. A footing is intentional. A footing requires design. A footing requires reinforcement. A, A footing is actually not a rut. It might look like a rut, but it's not a rut at all. And I want to tell you, I want to leave you with this, the number one way to build a footing in your mind, so you've recognized your ruts, you've allowed the Spirit of God to help you to renew your mind, He's kind of filled those ruts in, and now here's what I'm telling you, is I want you to reinforce a footing, don't go back to a rut, reinforce a footing. I want to tell you the number one way to do this, it's not rocket science, is to read God's Word to meditate on God's word. And here's the, here's the most important, to apply God's word. James says it's not enough to read his word, to look in the mirror and walk away. We have to allow his word to shape us, to change us. And that's how you begin to dig a footing so you can build your life on something, not by accident, but by purpose. Stand with me for just a moment. I'll leave you with one one verse, and we're gonna we're gonna pray together. Matthew chapter seven. I'm sorry, note takers. I just I know I, if you got to stand, so I know I'm I'm trying to end. Okay, Matthew chapter seven. Jesus tells a parable. You've probably heard this parable before, but I want to end with this. He says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice 
is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. So a rock is a firm place to build. A rock would be like that concrete footing that, that my brother and I built for our wall. And Jesus says, he says that this is how you do it. You hear my words, okay? Read his word. Meditate on his word, right? Memorize his word. And then he says, and puts them into practice. There's a lot of books that we read for fun, right? There's a lot of books that we just, we read, and we move on. I'm telling you the secret to reading God's word is you got to apply it. So Jesus says, this is a wise man who built his house on a rock. And then he goes on, he says, the rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew, and it beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on a sand, which by the way, it's really easy in sand to dig some ruts. And then it says this, the rain came, the streams rose, the winds blew, and it beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. So we come out of the cave, now what? We need some new pathways. Our worship team is going to lead us in a final song, and as that happens, I'm going to ask you to do the hard work of, number one, recognizing your ruts. Now here's what's interesting is you probably can recognize the ruts in your spouse's life, <laughs> in your kid's life, in your pastor's life, in your friend's life, and right, you, it's probably pretty easy for you to do that. But, but you know what we don't like to do? None of us enjoy recognizing the ruts in our own life. So I'm asking you, it's hard work. I'm asking you, as we sing this last song, to allow the Spirit of God to help you to identify those ruts in your own life. And I'm going to come back up, and we're going to submit those to God, and we're going to ask Him to begin the process of renewing our minds. And I'm just telling you, I've been praying over this for weeks. I'm so excited about today. To really, like Peter kicked off the series, but today's like my kickoff to this series. And I'm so excited because for so many of you, you haven't known how to come out of the cave or what to do as you come out of the cave. And today, the Spirit of God is going to help you to recognize patterns that you didn't even know were there that lead you directly back in to those painful places. Back into those lonely places. Back into those dark places. And today, the Spirit of God is going to renew your mind. You're going to begin to build new footings to build your life upon. I'm telling you, today will be a turning point for many of you. So worship team, come help us. Would you do this hard work while we worship? And then we're going to let God do the work that he can do so easily in all of our lives. Let's worship.